introduce, uh, my pleasure to introduce Chris Cosma, who is a graduate student and he's worked on an app to help people uh, to identify, I believe, and also to find what uh, the proper hosts are for butterflies. So I'll let you introduce yourself and just get right into it. But thank you for coming. All right. Well, thanks so much, David. And thank you for the invite. Thanks to Angel for reaching out to me. Um, so yeah, let me share my screen. Hopefully this works. Uh, you'll have to let me know. Does everyone see my presentation here? Yes. All yep. right. Loud and clear. Awesome. All right. So yeah, let me know if uh, if you guys can hear me and everything throughout this presentation. Um, and yeah, so today I'm going to be talking about um, prioritizing California native plants for butterfly and moth conservation. And a lot of this talk is going to be centered around a web application that I've developed um, to help people do just this, um, to find these hosts and nectar plants for our native California butterflies and moths. Um, so first, let me introduce myself. My name is Chris Cosma. I'm a PhD candidate uh, at UC Riverside in Dr. Nicole Rafferty's lab. Um, and so here's our lab group here. If you're interested in learning more about our lab, you can visit our website, raffertylab.ucr.edu. And generally in the Rafferty lab, we study the effects of climate change on mutualisms. Um, and mutualisms are just ecological interactions in which both partner species benefit in some way. And so the most classic example of mutualism that many of you are probably familiar with is um, pollination. So the interactions between plants and their pollinators, uh, the majority of which are insects. So bees, butterflies, and other insect pollinators. Um, but so we, we study plant pollinator interactions primarily in the lab, but we also look at other mutualisms like the below ground interactions between plants and their mycorrhizal fungi, um, as well as plants and rhizobial bacteria. So most of my research focuses on moth pollination, and I'm going to be talking a lot about moths in uh, this talk today. And generally, I want to convince you all that moths are not just these pests that eat our clothing or um, eat our grains in our pantry or fly into your head at night around lights. But instead, moths are important components of our ecosystems as pollinators, as well as really critical components of food webs as um, prey for birds, bats, and other animals. So I'm going to try to convince you today that moths are the good guys here. But I really want to begin this talk with a species that I suspect everyone here is probably familiar with, and that is the monarch butterfly. So you may know that um, just three months ago, July of this year, the monarch was officially classified as an endangered species by the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. Um, so they put the monarch on their red list. And the reason why they finally listed the monarch butterfly butterfly was um, due to a long history of decline um, and, and really critically in the past couple of years, some really, really drastic declines in their populations. So this graph here is from the Western Monarch Thanksgiving count, um, which tallies the population that overwinters here in California. And um, the, the green bars here are their population size through the years on the x-axis. And in 2020, they, uh, the Western Monarch Thanksgiving count recorded less than 2,000 monarchs, individual monarchs in, um, in this census. And that represented actually a over 99% decline in this population since the 1980s. But like many charismatic species that we study today, the monarch is really a poster child for a much larger problem. And so you've probably seen headlines like this one from the New York Times declaring that the insect apocalypse is here. 
Um, and so this one says, what does it mean for the rest of life on earth? And, and these headlines can be a bit inflammatory and they've caused a lot of uproar um, and a lot of concern in both scientific and non-scientific communities. Um, but the fact is, unfortunately, that insects really are declining globally. Um, a meta-analysis from 2019 found that up to 40% of insect species worldwide are threatened with extinction in the next couple of decades. And so this is the main figure from that paper that's just showing the proportion on the y-axis here. So all the way up to 100% of species in some of the major insect groups. So we have some beetle groups here on the left. We have hoverflies and um, apidae for bees here. Um, the proportion of species in each of these groups that are in some sort of decline. Um, and so these are the species that they're classifying as um, threatened with potential extinction. And we can see that really no group of insects here is safe. Some of them are faring worse than others. We have our dung beetles here for whatever reason, almost 100% of their species are threatened with extinction. Um, but notably, the group that I study, which is the insect order Lepidoptera, which includes butterflies and moths, um, is one of the most impacted taxa. So we have our butterflies and moths here, and we can see that over 60% of species globally in, in Lepidoptera are threatened with extinction in the next couple of decades. And so zooming into the US, um, about 48% of the species that have been assessed here in the US are declining. Um, and we can see by this heat map here, uh, where the warmer colors are the, the higher rates of, uh, of uh, loss of abundance here. So the, the species abundance trend um, in percent per year. And we can see that in the red here represents an almost 2% per year decline in butterfly abundance. And what we're seeing is that these declines are the most here in the Southwest um, and including a large portion of California, um, parts of the Intermountain West as well. And in fact, butterflies are shown to be declining by about 1.6% per year in abundance in the Western US. Um, so here in California and other Western states over the last few decades. And this is some work by Matt Forrester um, from UNR. And they've also found that dozens of other species besides the monarch butterfly are critically threatened right now. And some species are even more at risk than the monarch. Um, and this unfortunately also includes very widespread species that many of you are probably familiar with, like the one pictured here, which is the West Coast Lady. And when we zoom in on particular areas, these declines are, are really distressing. So here uh, in Los Angeles, close to where I live, I'm at, in Riverside, um, in Griffith Park, one of the largest urban parks in the state, 18% of butterfly species have gone locally extinct there in the past century. So looking at the broader picture here, there are about 240 butterfly species in California. And we know that right now, many of those species are declining. But like I said, most of my research focuses on moths and particularly their interactions with plants. So I'm gonna be talking a lot about moths here. So what about the around 5,000 species of moths that we have just in California alone? Well, the answer to that question is we, we don't really know how they're doing because unlike butterflies, no one's really analyzed their long-term population trends. But we do have comprehensive data from other parts of the world, including in Britain, where they found a 33% decline in moth abundance since uh, 1968. So just over the past 50 years, about 33% um, uh, of moths uh, or of moth abundance has declined. And so here's the graph um, from that study just showing this downward trend in one of their study species, the uh, Sussex Emerald here. So if I had to guess, even though we, we're not sure, um, if I had to guess our Western US moth species are probably not doing so great either. 
So this is this is bad news, uh, moths and butterflies globally, and we know also right here in the Western US are declining. Why does this matter? Well, one of the reasons why we care about Lepidoptera declines is that they're the second most diverse group of insects. So the order Lepidoptera um, includes over 13,000 species just in North America alone. And moths are much more diverse than butterflies. So this is uh, some a fact that's often met with a lot of surprise. About 95% of, of the species in the order Lepidoptera are moths and not butterflies. So they're around 10 times more diverse than butterflies. And this is our Lepidoptera phylogeny here. This is just showing our evolutionary relatedness between our species here. And this small highlighted section right here is uh, our, small, our small portion of Lepidoptera that are, are butterflies. Everything else in the order are moths. So they're super diverse, but um, another reason we care about Lepidoptera declines is that they're really, really important in our ecosystems. They play critical roles as herbivores in their larval stage, so as caterpillars eating those plants. Um, and they're also food for birds and bats and many other organisms um, as caterpillars, but also as adult moths and butterflies. And in these two roles as herbivores and prey, Lepidoptera actually transfer more energy from plants to other animals than all other herbivores combined. So out of all of our insect and mammal and reptile herbivores um, across groups, Lepidoptera are the single most important in transferring that energy from plants to other animals. And so I really want to stress this idea here that herbivory is a really good thing. When we see signs of herbivory on our plants, um, you can be sure that you are playing a part in helping our food webs persist. And so we can look at our our caterpillars here that are eating those plants, and we can follow the, that energy that starts with those plants, travels through those caterpillars to the animals that eat our caterpillars like birds, and then also up the food chain to those higher level predators. But also our adult butterflies and moths are, are eaten by organisms as well like bats. And so Lepidoptera really play a critical role in transferring this energy through food webs in our ecosystems. And in fact, caterpillars do this better than any other group of insect. They can make up 90% of the diet of some of our native songbirds. And so this is um, some of the work of Doug Tallamy has shown these relationships here. And if you haven't um, read Doug Tallamy's books or looked at his research, I highly recommend doing so. A lot of my own research is inspired by his work. And some bats are actually moth specialists. So they, they almost exclusively rely on moths in their diet. And so moths also are really important to our native bat populations. And so it's really no surprise when we look at these facts that Lepidoptera declines, um, so declines in our moths and butterflies have been linked to declines in native songbirds and bats in the United States. So another study by Doug Tallamy showed that insect eating birds, so um, those birds that uh, predominantly rely on insects for their diet have declined by um, a crazy amount in the US, 2.9 billion individuals over the last 50 years. Our, our native bird populations are not doing well. Um, now, in contrast to that, non-insect eating birds, those that eat uh, seeds, or other sources of food besides insects have actually increased by 26.2 million individuals over the last 50 years. So we see this drastic difference in bird populations that rely on insects and those that don't. So they're really important for our food webs. Um, and another way Lepidoptera are really important is that they're important pollinators. Um, and so you probably know that butterflies are going around flying between flowers, transferring pollen. And so butterflies get most of the credit here, but there is more and more research um, indicating that moths too are really important pollinators of our wild and agricultural plants. And so some of my research is pointing to this as well. And 
We know from recent studies that moths help pollinate things like avocados and berries and apples. And even although I can't really find much support for this in the broader literature, um, I think they probably contribute to citrus pollination because I've seen them right here in my backyard in Riverside pollinating some of these uh, citrus trees right in my own yard. So here's just a little video that I took of this. Alrighty, so they're important for agriculture, but we also, there's a long history of, of uh, studies focused on moth pollination, particularly from this part of the world. So in California, we know we have the really famous yucca, yucca moth relationship. And we also have uh, hawk moth pollination of species like datura and evening primrose and agave. So right here in California, we know that moths are, are really important pollinators of our native plants as well. And so I'm not going to be talking about this work as much today, but in some of my other research, I go out to the field and I collect moths um, in these little light traps and I catalog these moths, I identify them. And then I, and here are some pictures of our, some of our native moth species. So moths are not just as boring. Could I ask whoever has their volume on to mute, please? Sorry. <laughs> All right. Um, so where was I? Uh, yeah, so here's some pictures of our native moths. Um, this is a hawk moth, so these can be as big as your hand. Um, and here's a tiger moth that we have here in California. And so in the, the second part of this research, I pull the pollen that they're carrying on their mouth parts, so those sucking proboscis that they have, um, and I identify that pollen to determine which plants they're interacting with, with which plants they're visiting and potentially pollinating. Um, and so here are some pictures of the proboscis from moths covered in pollen grains, and some of these have a massive amount of pollen on them. And I've found so far in this research that over 50% of moths in Southern California uh, habitat, so across different habitat types here, are transporting pollen. Um, and this is not just our, our big hawk moths that some of you are probably familiar with as pollinators. You probably see white line sphinx in the evenings visiting some of your native plants. But this includes more of the um, boring gray brown moths that you probably don't even notice or maybe you may notice fluttering around your lights at night. Um, these moths are also out there visiting flowers and, and potentially helping to pollinate these native plant species. So this is the pollen uh, that I pulled just from this uh, boring little, uh, not really interesting looking moth here. All right, so Lepidoptera play really important roles in ecosystems as I hope I just showed you. Um, and so we wanna protect them and protect these services that other organisms, but also humans rely on. And so doing that requires an understanding of why they've been so impacted by global change. And this is not an easy question to answer because um, as David Wagner put it in 2021, um, by describing the threats to insects as death by a thousand cuts. Um, insects are just being attacked from all sides. And so death by a thousand cuts is this idea that there are just so many threats being thrown at insects that oftentimes it's really hard to determine the single or the main cause behind any decline in one species. And oftentimes it's probably more of a combination of many interacting factors. And those include things like habitat loss. Um, so we're, we're destroying our native habitats in a lot of different ways. Um, introduced species and invasive species are also affecting our native insects and the plants that they rely on. We have pollution in its various forms, including light pollution. So that's one that you may have heard about recently. Light pollution um, is bad for all sorts of organisms, but especially nocturnal ones like moths that are attracted to lights. We have things like pesticide use. So spraying um, insecticides and herbicides in our agricultural fields, but even at our homes. 
And then, of course, we have climate change. So a lot of my research focuses on the effects of climate change. And climate change encompasses all sorts of negative effects on species, um, ranging from increased intensity and frequency of forest fires to um, uh, decreased precipitation and uh, hotter conditions as well. And so I want to focus in on the effects of climate change here. This heat map that I showed you earlier showing that the highest rate of butterfly decline here in the southwest parts of California um, is highly correlated with recent climate change in this in this area. And so we see that the um, abundance of butterflies on the y-axis of these graphs um, decrease with uh, lower precipitation. So as it's becoming drier, butterflies are declining, um, but also with higher temperature. So as it's becoming hotter, uh, butterflies are also decl declining. So we know that the Southwest in particular is becoming much hotter and drier with climate change. So in summary, um, you know, all of these factors are leading to declines in Lepidoptera, just like they're leading to declines um, in other insects as well. But one thing that we know in particular about Lepidoptera, and especially from the example of the monarch butterfly that's taught us so much about species interactions, is that butterflies um, and moths rely very strongly on particular hosts and nectar plants. And I'm going to be talking about this in the rest of this talk. So we know that butterfly or the monarch butterfly needs milkweed. And this is an example of a uh, specialized ecological re uh, relationship. And so we know that specialist species are at greater risk of extinction under environmental change because they're more easily uncoupled from those resources that they need to rely on. And so I'm going to go through a quick example of this idea here. Let's say um, on the other side of the spectrum, we have our ecological generalists. And a generalist is uh, just a species that can rely on all sorts of different resources. So if we're talking about plants for insects, a, a generalist may rely on a dozen different plant species as its host plant. And so the extinction or the local loss of any one of these species from a habitat is not likely to affect that generalist very drastically because it can rely on any one of those alternative interaction partners, those alternative plants. Now, when we take a look at our ecological specialists, um, such as the monarch butterfly, that same plant extinction is likely to have a much larger effect on that species because again, it's the only plant it can rely on. This is a specialized relationship. And so the monarch is not alone here. In fact, 90% of all plant eating insects, including um, the majority of butterflies and moths are host plant specialists. And so this means that often they can um, rely on just one lineage of plants. So the monarchs can pretty much eat any species of milkweed. Some are better than others. Um, but often this can also mean that they, the species can literally just eat one single plant species. And that's the only plant they can rely on. And so this brings um, attention to the idea, the importance of native plants for native insects. Um, and we know that about the monarch, the monarch needs its native milkweed plants. Um, and I really like this idea or this definition of native from Rick Dark and Doug Tallamy from their book, The Living Landscape. A plant or animal that has evolved in a given place over a period of time sufficient to develop complex and essential relationships with a physical environment and other organisms in a given ecological community. So the reason I really like this definition of native is because it brings attention to a really important factor in why native insects need native plants, and that's because of coevolution. And so over thousands of years of living alongside one another, these species of plants and insects have developed these really specialized relationships. And that's why oftentimes um, our native butterflies and moths can only eat our uh, species of native plants. 
And so it's really no surprise that lepidopter declines, um, including right here in California, have been shown to be driven by the loss of native hosts and nectar plants due to things like habitat destruction and climate change and all those other factors um, that I talked about. So a really important consideration here is climate change and um, pesticide use. That's not only affecting our native insects directly, but it's affecting the plants that they rely on, those native plants that they need to survive. All right, so, so far this talk, and I apologize for this, has been um, a little bit depressing. This is, this is not good news, um, but I really want to focus the rest of this talk on what we can do about it. Um, and I'm going to show you what I've been doing about it, but um, a large part of what I've been doing is helping everyone improve the way we plant for native insects. And so we know that what we can do to help protect insects is plant native plants, and the monarch has showed us this. Um, native plants, in fact, support up to 15 times more native Lepidoptera species than are introduced in ornamental plants that we use in landscaping. And again, this is because of that shared coevolutionary history between our native insects and our native plants. We also know that um, in the context of climate change, increasing the extent and connectivity of diverse native, native habitat is really critical. Um, so that's why we see a lot of attention on things like habitat corridors that maybe span highways to connect uh, a forest on one side with the forest on the other. And in fact, I've heard that they're instituting one of these near LA pretty soon. Um, but what that also means, increasing this connectivity in landscapes that look more and more like this, um, is using any amount of land, including our very own yards and gardens, um, to help in increasing this connectivity of native habitat. And so it's not really good news that most of the plants that we use for landscaping are, in fact, non-native and introduced species. That includes 2% of land in the U.S., some four, 40 million acres, which is monoculture grass lawn, so turf grass, um, a tremendous amount of land available to convert potentially into native habitat. Um, and this also includes things like the trees we use to line our streets. So um, another study by Doug Talamy showed that in Portland, Oregon, 92% of the trees that they use in those neighborhoods, just the ones lining the sidewalks um, and the streets are introduced non-native species. And so we have a lot of work to do in, in the places that we directly have control over. Um, and, and what this really means is that any yard, any garden, even a pot on a balcony. So here, these monarch pictures are from just a pot uh, on my balcony. I know many of you have probably also uh, planted milkweeds for your monarchs. Um, any, of, any small amount of space can be an important insect waste station. So important um, piece in the mosaic of a health, healthy e ecosystem here. And so there have been studies showing that milkweed gardens on private lands um, in people's yards and gardens um, can contribute effectively to monarch conservation. Mm -hmm. So I know I'm preaching to the choir here about the importance of planting native plants, um, but I do think that we can all improve the way we plant native for uh, insect conservation. And so I'm gonna go through what I mean by that here. The monarch was at risk, uh, so we planted milkweeds. Um, and this is something many of you are familiar with. But as the list of endangered or threatened or at risk Lepidoptera grows larger and larger, which it is, the list of native plants that we need to support them also grows. And so effective Lepidoptera conservation means moving from this restricted focus on individual species and interactions like the monarch milkweed relationship to entire communities of threatened Lepidoptera species. And one way we can do that is by using ecological networks. So ecological networks are the framework that I use in my research and um, networks just describe the interactions between entire communities of interacting plants and insects. So we have maybe our host plants here on the bottom, each one of these representing a different species connected to our, uh, our Lepidoptera species here on the top. 
And we can analyze these sorts of networks to help identify important species, so ones that are disproportionately important to the ecosystem, as well as ones that are more vulnerable. And this can help us um, aid, uh, this can aid in conservation prioritization. Um, and I'll talk more about that in a second here. But this may include specialist insects like our monarch um, our monarch butterfly that only rely on very few plant species. But this can also include um, our native plant species that support more insects in the community than maybe some of these others do. And so in order to advance Lepidoptera conservation here in California, I built a tool called the Butterfly Net, and this is a web application um, that helps anyone in California find the best hosts and nectar plants for butterflies and moths wherever you live. And so I'm going to be talking about how I built this app and why we need it for the rest of this talk here. Um, it is a what's called a shiny app, um, but you can access this on your computer and it does work best on a computer. I'm going to throw it in the chat again real quick. Um, Hopefully it doesn't crash. It's it's not the best interface right now. And when a lot of people are using it at once, uh, it, it gets a bit laggy. But um, but yeah, let's explore this app. So so the the data that I use to build this app, it comes from a kind of a naturalist guide um, called California Plants as Resources for Lepidoptera. And this was compiled by a guy named Jeffrey Caldwell, who um, was a restorationist. Uh, who lived in the Bay Area. He's, current reti he's currently retired. I think he's living um, somewhere in the Midwest now, but he spent a, a large portion of his, his career compiling this data set that includes um, interactions between butterflies and moths and their native California hosts and nectar plants across the entire state of California. And so what I've done is I've digitized this data um, and I've converted it into the interaction matrices that we can use to model and analyze these sorts of ecological interaction networks. And it's really hard to visualize such um, massive networks, but I'm going to show you what are called circle graphs right now. Um, and what you see as a continuous line along the outside of these graphs um, it are really uh, hundreds of different uh, species of plants and insects represented by these shapes here, connected with the rest of the network through their interactions represented by these lines. And so between the flower visitation network, which is the uh, interactions between adult butterflies and moths and their nectar plants, so the plants that they visit for um, gathering nectar from, uh, and the herbivory network, which is the, the interactions between our caterpillars and their host plant species. Um, we have thousands of native plant species in California, thousands of native butterfly and moth species, and thousands of interactions recorded in the state. And so through analyzing this data, I've come up with three important considerations for more effective Lepidoptera conservation in California. And number one is that we have to be planting both native host and nectar plants. I'm going to talk about that in a second here. Number two, we have to be prioritizing the most important plant species. And number three, we have to consider geographic variation in species and interactions. So I'm going to go through each one of these three points now. But before I get to point number one, I do want to introduce the importance of considering geographic variation. Um, and that's because a lot of my results for these first couple of sections rely on this. Um, so as as you all are aware of, California is a huge and very diverse state. And when I say diverse, we have a diversity not only of species, um, but also a diversity of interactions um, and a diversity of habitat types. And those all can vary with things like latitude and elevation and distance from coast. And so a really good example to, to highlight this uh, consideration here is, again, coming back to the monarch butterfly. So I'm going to be using the monarch as an example throughout this talk. Um, and we know that there's a, around 15 species of native milkweed in California that occur here. And each one of those species occurs in a slightly different range across the state. So the colors here are just um, representing different species of milkweed. And we know that planting locally native 
types uh, uh, of milkweed, locally native milkweed species is really important um, to, to maximize the benefit to monarchs. So when you don't use milkweeds that are native to your area of California, you risk confusing monarch migration patterns and also introducing more harmful parasites. So it's really important to use the species that naturally occur in your area. And so what I've done, applying that same sort of concept to entire communities of plants and insects, is I've taken our ecoregions in California. And our ecoregions are just areas of, of similar climatic conditions, so similar temperature and precipitation, and it could be caused by elevation or latitude or other factors here. Um, and within any area in those ecoregions, so um, let's say we're in San Jose here in the Bay Area, um, Within any area that you live in, there's going to be some uh, different native habitats that occur around you. So here we have anything from mixed chaparral to different types of grasslands that are occurring in this area. And in those different types of habitats, we have different species that are occurring um, in certain habitats versus others. Some species may occur across habitats. Um, but what I've done is created a program that can take species occurrence data and overlay it with these ecoregion and habitat layers. And we can then determine just the species that occur in that habitat type in that ecoregion. And we can create these localized interaction networks composed just of the, in the species and interactions that are occurring right near you. And so anywhere you live in the state, this app will show you your, um, your local interaction networks. And so just to show you how it works in the app real quick, if you, if you go into the app, the first thing you'll do is um, enter your address. It has to be in California um, or click on it on the map. So you can also find it on the map and click on it. The first thing the app is going to do is tell you which ecoregion you are in. So we have both our level three ecoregion. These are our larger, broader ecoregions. And so San Jose is in the central California foothills and coastal mountains ecoregion. Um, and it's also going to tell you a more highly resolved ecoregion, our level four ecoregions. Um, and then you're going to be able to select which habitat type you want to emulate. So um, if you're planting a, a, a garden that you want to, it to look like an annual grassland, or maybe you want to emulate the chaparral, um, you can select your desired habitat type, and then it's going to spit out your list of priority plant species. And I'm going to tell you how the app determines these here in a second. You can choose to focus on host and nectar plants. You can choose to focus on just your host plants, just your nectar plants. Um, and then you can also choose to focus on butterflies and moths or one or the other as well. And it's also going to show you um, visualizations here of your local interaction network. Here we have on the left our, our nectar plant interaction network and on our right our host plant interaction network. All right. So coming back to my first point here, the importance of planting native hosts and nectar plants. And so we see a lot of um, emphasis on things like uh, pollinator gardens. And so these pollinator gardens usually emphasize the importance of planting those, uh, those showy flowers that attract our adult butterflies, our pretty butterflies and bees. Um, and ones that you can see flying around during the day and collecting that pollen and nectar. Um, on the other side of the spectrum, um, in conservation efforts like those focused on the monarch butterfly, we see a focus just on our host plants. So our host plants, again, like the milkweed. But I want to re review the Lepidoptera life cycle here to emphasize a really important point, which is that Lepidoptera rely on native plant resources at each stage of their life cycle. All right, so this is probably review for a lot of you, but our eggs, um, and this is showing the monarch, but do you remember that this applies to most butterfly and moth species? Um, our eggs are deposited on our native host plants. Our caterpillars, again, are often highly specialized due to those co-evolutionary relationships um, on their host plants. Even things like the placement of chrysalis and cocoons benefits from diverse native plant resources. 
And then of course we have our adults, um, our adult butterflies and moths, which visit flowers for nectar and in doing so help pollinate those plants. And there's been studies showing that native plants as opposed to our ornamental introduced plants um, are often more attractive to butterflies and moths and um, often also more nourishing to them. So they provide um, better, uh, better nutritional content for these species. And so just focusing on our two main resource use life stages here, our caterpillars and our adults, it becomes very clear that Lepidoptera need native host plants, which again are those plants that are eaten by our larval Lepidoptera, our caterpillars, as well as native nectar plants in their adult stage. Um, and those nectar plants are the ones visited and often pollinated by our adult butterflies and moths. And there is a, a body of research supporting this. Um, number one, diet breath. So just the number of interaction partners, the number of plants they re, uh, use as resources um, in both the larval and adult stages are significant and independent determinants of Lepidopter extinctions. So we have to look at both of those. Um, and in fact, the loss of monarch nectar plants um, could actually contribute more to their decline than the loss of milkweed. Um, a couple of recent studies have shown that these, the, the loss of these nectar plants are, are perhaps even more important. So what this is really telling us here is that we conservation efforts, um, including the efforts in our yards and gardens, need to consider resource dependencies at each life stage. And one of the ways we can do that is by looking at multi-layer ecological networks. And so multi-layer networks are really just networks linking different interaction types. And so on the left, we again have our herbivory network with our caterpillars. And on the right, we have our flower visitation network with our adult butterflies and moths. And these can be linked both by our shared plant species here on the bottom. So um, plants that are perhaps herbivorized, but then also pollinated by Lepidoptera. And then they can also, in the case of Lepidoptera, be linked by these shared insect species, our caterpillar that shows up as an herbivore of a plant, and then maybe pollinates that same plant when it's an adult, or maybe different plants in the community as well. And so what I've shown, what I've seen by analyzing these networks, number one is that caterpillars are indeed highly specialized on their native host plants. And so this is confirming a lot of past research in other systems. Um, and so what we have here on the X axis is the number of host plants. Um, so starting with one host plant and going all the way up to about um, 80 host plants on the X axis. And then on the Y axis, we just have the percentage of Lepidopter species that have that number of host plant host plants. Um, and this goes up to 50%. So number one, I've shown that 43%, almost half of Lepidopter species in California have just one host plant species. And a full 73%, so three or fewer, 73% um, uh, of Lepidopter have three or fewer host plants. Um, so these three bars here. And so caterpillars are highly specialized. The average there was 3.6 host plants per species. And in fact, they're more specialized than the adults. Um, in the flower visitation network, our adults have an average of 14.7 nectar plants per species. And what this um, level of specialization as caterpillars means is that our caterpillars are the more sensitive life stage to potential plant extinctions. Um, and so what I've done here is I've simulated plant extinctions using a computer program, which just takes out plants from that network and then shows what may happen to the caterpillar species that rely on them in, in that interaction network. And it only takes an average of about one and a half plant extinctions to drive one insect extinct from that network. Now, on the other hand, in the flower visitation network, it takes an average of 6.25 plant extinctions to drive one insect extinct. So we can see from this that this uh, herbivory network, these host plant relationships with our caterpillars are much more sensitive to plant species loss. And these plant species losses, again, can be driven by anything from climate change to habitat loss, 
um, to herbicides. And so we know, again, that caterpillars here in California, as they are in other parts of the country and world, are picky eaters. Um, they're very specialized on their native host plants. And what that means is we have to be picky in choosing which plants to provide them. But we've also shown that there's a positive correlation between the number of interaction partners a, a Lepidoptera species has in one network um, and the other. And so here in this graph, we're just showing the degree, and degree is just a word for the number of interaction partners. And so each dot here is represents one insect species. And so the number of interaction partners they have in the flower visitation network versus the number they have in the herbivory network. And we can see this positive correlation here. And this was statistically significant. And what, what this means here is that our specialized species, our specialized, our, our most specialized caterpillars often tend to be even um, more specialized as adults as well. So they're kind of doubly sensitive to potential plant species losses. Um, and then really importantly, we've also found that Lepidoptera use discrete host and nectar plants. And so this is kind of a, a, uh, a complex graph here, and I'm, I'm using you guys as kind of a test for, I'm giving this talk at the CMPS conference, um, so please let me know if I explain this um, in a way that makes it understandable. But this is called an NMDS plot, and so this is just a way to visualize complex data. Um, and so every dot in this plot represents a group of plants, a, a plant community, if you will. Um, and so in our blue dots, um, we have our groups of host plants. Um, so again, those are our caterpillar host plants. And each dot is a group of plants in a different habitat type across California. And each yellow or orange dot here is a group of nectar plants. And the distance between these, each dot corresponds to how different that group of plants is from one another. And so what we're seeing here, the fact that we can see these distinct groupings of nectar plants on the bottom and host plants on the top means that these, um, these groups of host plants used by caterpillars are significantly different than the groups of nectar plants used by our, our adult butterflies and moths. So again, this is showing us that Lepidopter are using discrete hosts and nectar plants um, and not usually the same species in any habitat across California. And so concluding this section here, we found that while the caterpillar stage is more specialized and that makes them more vulnerable to plant species losses in these networks, we also found that specialized species may be more vulnerable in both life stages, so they may be extra sensitive. Um, and then we also found here at the end that Lepidoptera used discrete hosts and nectar plants um, across habitats in California. So what this is telling us here is that although a lot of the effort is usually on um, focusing on our nectar plants um, or just on our host plants, like for the monarch, what we really need for effective Lepidoptera conservation is prioritizing both native host and nectar plants. Um, and this is a sign from the UCR Botanic Garden, which emphasizes this really key point in planting those communities of host plants and nectar plants. Um, and part of this kind of means um, shifting the way we view our yards and gardens. Um, and so we need, just like we need pollinator gardens, we need herbivore gardens too. And we need to become familiar and um, comfortable with the fact that plants get eaten. Um, and, and again, when you see that sign of herbivory in your garden, especially on your native plants, that should be a sign to you that you are helping support a local food web. And so it really, at the end of the day, comes down to this key idea that although we like seeing most, for the most part, our adult butterflies flying around, um, without the caterpillar, you, you don't get those butterflies or those moths. Uh, and the, the reverse is true as well. Without supporting our adult butterflies and moths with the nectar plants that they need, we're not gonna get those future generations of caterpillars. All right, so coming back to point number two here, 
the importance of prioritizing the most important plants. All right, so California is a extremely diverse state. Um, and you may know that the California floristic province is one of Earth's biodiversity hotspots. There, I think there's, uh, now I'm forgetting the number, 16, uh, maybe more than that. <laughs> um, but, but a relatively high concentration of native and endemic species in a relatively small geographic area. And that means that we have over 6,500 native or endemic plant species. Now of those, uh, of those 6,500 plant species, about 1,900 are included in this data set as known Lepidoptera hosts and nectar plants. So this still leaves us with a tremendous number of plant species to choose from if our goal is to support Lepidoptera. Um, and so we have some prioritizing to do here. And I want to begin the discussion of how we should prioritize these plant species with a unfortunate reality, which is the fact that we can't save everything. So again, um, you know, uh, a large percentage of insects across the board, including over 60% of butterflies and moths are threatened with extinction in just the next couple of decades. We're simply not gonna be able to save those hundreds of thousands of species. And we're really living in an era of conservation triage right now. We need to be prioritizing certain species at the potential risk of losing others. So this brings up some really tough questions, and I'm I'm not pretending to be an expert uh, or know the answers to these questions here. Um, but you know, should we be focusing on providing resources for our rare, declining, or already endangered species like our monarch butterfly? And a lot of conservation in the U.S. has taken this approach. We take our charismatic species like the monarch. Um, and we, we put most of our money for conservation and protecting these few species. Or on the other side, should we instead be focusing on providing resources for as many species as possible? Um, and I'll show you what I mean by that. But as an example here, we have a uh, Ceanothus species here in California, which provide resources as hosts and nectar plants for not one or two, but for hundreds of Lepidopter species, both butterflies and moths. And so these are pictures of just some of those Lepidopter caterpillars that use Ceanothus as a host plant. So we have a sort of dichotomy here and potential approaches to, uh, to conservation, but I, I do want to mention that this is not always black and white. And so the approach that I use comes back to a really old but important concept in ecology called the keystone species concept. Um, and keystone species are just those species in our ecosystems that are disproportionately important to the rest of the system, like the keystone in a Roman arch. And so what I've found here is that um, not all plants are doing the same amount of work in our ecosystems here. And what I mean by that here is that few plant species support the majority of Lepidopter species. And here we have our Lepidopter accumulation curves here. And what these are showing is just the, on the x-axis, the percent of plant species um, that support a certain amount, uh, a, a certain percent of Lepidopter species on the y-axis. And so to reach that 90%, 90% of Lepidoptera species supported, it only takes 32% of host plants and 9.3% of nectar plant species. So again, a relatively small percentage, 32% of host plants and 9.3% of nectar plants are supporting the majority 90% of Lepidoptera species here in California. But we can take this keystone species concept a step further with network analysis, and we can analyze what's called network modularity. So modularity is just the tendency of groups of species within networks to form compartments of more closely interacting species. Um, and so two important roles have been proposed 
Um, and here, let's say this is our whole network, our entire network, maybe in one type of habitat, wherever you are in California. And our gray, our shaded gray areas are our modules. So those groups, those clusters of more tightly interacting species. Um, and within these modules, we have our hubs, our module hubs, which are species that are just highly connected within their own modules. So here we have these in the red. And then we have our module connectors. And module connectors are really good at connecting different modules to one another. And so they provide that sort of cohesion in the network, keeping everything together and tight. And really importantly, the loss of these module hubs and connectors has been predicted and shown empirically to lead to um, losses, cascading extinctions of other species across these networks. So these are really the species that we want to prioritize protecting because they're the ones that provide that stability to the entire system. And so we can analyze this modularity both at local and landscape scales. And so when I say local scales, um, let's say you want to plant a grassland habitat in Southern California, wherever you're living. Um, let's say this network is just representing your local interaction network in a grassland ecosystem. Um, so we can perform this sort of modularity analysis to find which species are most important right here where you are in that habitat type, but we can also perform this modularity analysis at a landscape level and show how certain species connect different types of habitats to one another. And these could be plant species that are serving as kind of stepping stones that show up in multiple different types of habitats and maintain that connectivity for those butterfly and moth species that are traveling between those habitat types. And so when I showed you that uh, the app will spit out that priority plant species list, what's happening in the background there is this sort of network analysis. Um, it's analyzing these interaction networks in your area to find those keystone plant species, those plant species that are most important at maintaining the stability and the integrity of the entire network as a whole. All right, and so I, I wanted to point out here really importantly that this ranking method does not necessarily sacrifice our rare and threatened species. So again, it's not always black and white here, whether we're protecting those rare and dangerous species or prioritizing those more common generalist species. Um, and I wanna again focus on the monarch milkweed relationship to emphasize this point. Um, so our milkweed species in the Asclepius genus are common throughout California. We have about 15 species. Um, and although we know them as the monarch plant, uh, milkweeds, in fact, are, well, a host for four other Lepidoptera species, including one of my favorites, the Cleo tiger moth here. Um, and they're also a nectar source for 104 Lepidoptera species in California. And so when you use this app, you may notice that our Asclepius species here are often at the top of these ranked lists. So often in those top 10 plant species, because they're providing all of these resources, not just for our monarch butterfly, but for hundreds of other Lepidoptera species across the state, particularly as a nectar plant. All right, so concluding part two here, we found that few keystone plant species support the majority of Lepidopter species. And those are really those plant species that we wanna be prioritizing in all landscapes, in our gardens and in our yards um, to support the most Lepidoptera and to provide that overall stability to our ecosystems. We also saw that the, this community level plant ranking does not necessarily sacrifice are rare and threatened species like the monarch butterfly. All right, so coming back to my last point here, the importance of considering geographic variation in species and interactions. And so I already kind of went through how I use our California ecoregions and habitat types and uh, our occurrence, our species occurrence data to find those local interaction networks composed only of species and interactions right from your immediate location and habitat type. And again, that provides these localized networks wherever you are in California. Now, the importance of doing this is not just because we know that we have different plant species in Northern California than we do in Southern California, and we have different 
Lepidoptera species in Northern California than we do in Southern California, but also that the composition of these top 10 species, so just our most important species, varies significantly between different locations and ecoregions in California. So this is another one of those big um, complex NMDS plots here. Um, and this time, each one of these dots is a habitat type um, in California. And these are colored by the ecoregion that they occur in. So here's our ecoregion map, and we can see these our cluster here of kind of uh, teal or turquoise blue here corresponds to our um, our California foothills, um, et cetera. And so these, uh, the, again, the distance between each of these dots corresponds to how different that composition of top 10 plant species this time are from one another. And so this is a, a, a complex plot and a lot to look at. And so what I've done here is I've just summarized it by taking the mean and standard error of each of these clusters. So again, each cluster here is an ecoregion. And the fact that we see distinct separation between these, um, these uh, ecoregions, um, and again, composed of these top 10 plants in each of these ecoregions means that these top 10 plant species are varying significantly across our landscapes. And this was um, statistically significant when analyzed with a permanova. And we saw that these top 10 plant species um, don't only vary broadly between our ecoregions, so those broader ecoregions, but when we zoom in and on one ecoregion, we also see that the composition of these top 10 plant species also vary significantly between habitat types in those ecoregions. So here, this is colored by the habitat type um, within the Southern California northern Baja coast ecoregion, which is where I and probably many of you are from. And so again, we see this distinct separation between our different habitat types, meaning that the composition of the top 10 plant species varies significantly between those habitat types. And we can see that some of them are uh, more different than others. Some of them cluster uh, a little bit closer together. Now, this all makes sense when we zoom in and look at how individual species vary in importance across the landscape. And so what I've done here is I've zoomed in on just one species, our uh, yarrow, Achillea millifolium. Um, and I'm showing here on the y-axis a metric of plant importance, which is, um, it ranges from zero to one. Um, <clears throat> And on the y-axis here, we just have our ecoregions. And this is roughly organized from north to south through California. And so we can see here how drastically this plant species varies in our importance metrics, again, determined by that uh, network analysis to find those keystone species. Um, and we see that Achillea millifolium is much more important in certain ecoregions than it is in others. And it seems to peak in our central basin and range. And now this is the same thing, just for a different species, this time narrow leaf milkweed, one of our milkweed species, and we can see a slightly different pattern. Um, this species becomes more important in the southern part of its range. And then we have yet another species, um, chemise, which uh, gets uh, less important uh, in the more southerly ecoregions. And then again, a different pattern for California mugwort. So we can see that each plant varies in importance across the landscape and each different species has a slightly different pattern of where it's more important and where it's less important. And when I plot all of those lines for each of those four species that I just showed on the same plot here, so again, that importance metric ranging from zero to one on the y-axis here, we see that not only do they vary um, within a species and how important they are across the landscape, but the different species vary pretty drastically on how different they are from one another in terms of importance to Lepidoptera. So we can see Achillea millifolium, our yarrow, is pretty much consistently um, a, an important plant species for Lepidoptera, usually in the higher end of this uh, range. Uh, 
Um, whereas our California mugwort here in the blue at the bottom is generally not a super important plant across its range for Lepidoptera. All right, so concluding this last part here, we saw that the identity of the top 10 plant species for Lepidoptera varies significantly between those ecoregions and habitat types. And we also saw that individual species roles shift significantly significantly throughout the landscape as well. And so briefly, what I want to do with this data set in the future here is look at climate change predictions. And so all of these local networks right now are based on the current range of these species. And so these blue dots maybe represent the current community and range in a certain location in California. So we have our current community. But one thing we know about climate change is that species ranges are shifting, often northward and often up in elevation. And so what I'd like to do is combine this sort of network analysis with um, species distribution modeling, which predicts where species were, will occur in the future with climate change to see in our future climate change communities, which plant species are going to be the most important for Lepidoptera. And they may be quite different than our current community. All right, so coming back to conclude this talk, I want to uh, circle back to the monarch butterfly, our favorite butterfly species here. And remember at the beginning of this talk, I gave you some bad news and told you that the 2020 census for the Western monarch, um, which overwinters in California, recorded fewer than 2,000 individual monarch butterflies. But there is some good news here. In 2021, so just last year, they recorded an over a hundredfold increase in the Western monarch population, um, around 150,000 individuals. And so this was a drastic, drastic improvement compared to the previous year. And a lot of the success behind this has been attributed to those monarch or those milkweed planting efforts. But I, I hope that I've shown you here today that the monarch butterfly is not the only species that is at risk. And with the butterfly net, we can all start planting the best hosts and nectar plants for butterflies and moths anywhere in California. And lastly, I'd like to just say that the butterfly net is a work in progress. So I do encourage you to use the app, but I also um, really appreciate any comments and suggestions. So if if you see something that doesn't look right, um, please report the error using the links on the website, or you can always email me. My email address is posted here. Um, and with that, I'd like to thank everyone. Thank you for um, coming here today and listening to this talk, and I can take any questions. Thanks, Chris. That was a great talk, and uh, I learned a lot. Love the pictures. Um, uh, that's a staggering uh, statistics that, that um, moths are um, responsible for more uh, conversion of energy from plants than all other species, all, all other um, groups put together. Um, let me see, there was some questions in the chat. I'm not too good at operating the chat. Um, let's see. Um, I have a question. Please go ahead. Yeah, uh, I was going to ask you for any good news at the end of this, and you, you gave it to me. Uh, I belong to an environmental organization that's now trading good news, because I see all the bad news all the time. I know the bad news in spades, and I wake up with it and go to bed with it. <laughs> but we need good news once in a while. One of the good news is young people like you are picking up the banner and carrying it on for us older folks, you look around, you see a lot of older people on this blog, for example. I hate to say it, but I mean, you know, we're all getting there. Speak for yourself, Mike. Yes, I know. I'm speaking for myself. Okay, there's nobody I don't know. This young person's carrying it on, and I congratulate you. I'm, I'm, if I had to do it all over again when I was your age, I would have done what you're doing, this kind of, this kind of area. Another a comment is... I have a large uh, schoolyard habitat in Long Beach. And from the beginning, I wanted uh, actually a full on botanic garden. I just didn't want to plant coastal sage or coastal prairie and coastal strand plants. I wanted to branch out and do chaparral, 
and all of Southern California, even to the deserts. I even have a desert wash because I'm an old Mojave freak. And in that desert wash, we have plants like Caliandra, okay, which don't grow in, you know, anything but the desert. And they're full of gray hair streaks all summer, all over them. And I've got a, an, a bunch of Asclepias subulata, which you say is not good to plant in a, let's say a coastal area in Southern California, because uh, it's uh, kind of messes up the uh, web there. But I want you to know a friend of mine planted in Asclepias subulata in Cerritos, California, and he had monarchs on it and he took pictures of it. I had never seen a monarch feasting on Asclepias subulata, this desert milkweed. So I wanted to give you that little anecdotal thing. Plus the subulata also hosts the tarantula wasp. And it's always great to see them in summer coming over that wicked look they have, you know, coming all over the waxy uh, flowers and all that. So when you have a great variety of plants, you're also hosting this kind of whole other palette of pollinators. So uh, I wanted you to know that. Uh, but the only butterfly that doesn't seem to hang around our plant with our 300 species, approximately, I've got all the trees. I've got, let's say, a Catalina cherry that hosts the morning cloaks. They go all over the blooms of the Catalina cherry, which probably a lot of people don't know in addition to the sap on some trees, you know that. Um, but um, we've got trees and shrubs from all over California, especially Southern California. So we have an enormous variety of uh, uh, butterflies in there. Like for, we've got red thistle, uh, I've got, um, let's see, verbena, Cedrus Island verbena, coyote mint, the caliandra I mentioned, and deer weed, so and all of the buckwheats, all of, great variety of buckwheats from coast out into the desert. So I just want to know, let you know that a, a garden like that can also host a great variety of um, uh, pollinators. In addition to most of my milkweeds are narrow leaf milkweeds, which are appropriate for for the area, of course. But I'll, I've also got Areocarpa. And I've also got the subulata. So, but in a, in a speciosa, they all seem to work. Though I've seen the monarch butter, uh, the monarch caterpillars on the area carpa and the speciosa too. I just wanted to put that all out there, as uh, yeah. just adding to the mix. Yeah, I appreciate your comments. Yeah, it sounds like you're doing a lot of really great stuff out there. Um, I love it. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, and yeah, I, I really, I agree that, you know, this talk was focused on Lepidoptera, but when you're planting native plants, you're supporting all sorts of types of insects, including those, yeah. those pollinators, those wasps, um, and yeah, milkweed is, is a great plant, uh, not just for the monarch, um, and, and yeah, mm -hmm. thank you. Good. So, um, great yeah, talk, by the way, great talk. Thanks. Yeah, I'd like to give a shout out to Mike, who was just talking. He's uh, for 27 years, he's been working on a um, native plant garden at uh, Prisk Elementary School in uh, Long Beach. And uh, he was telling me over the weekend that a young uh, elementary school student came up to him and said, this is my Mr. Mike, this is my happy place. <laughs> so Mike is really doing something to uh, He's walking the walk to try to get young people involved uh, it, with native plants and stuff. But I agree completely, Mike, that uh, showing positives, you know, just having bad news all the time, you know, it, we, we always could benefit from good news. And also people need to know not only what not to do, but what, what they can do. And once they yes. realize that there's a, a direction that they can go in, then right. many people will run. Uh, you know, and really put, put their efforts into it if they, they feel like they're doing something useful. Okay. Right. Thank you. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, did you want to respond, Mike? Or what? I don't know. Anyway, there's uh, some questions here. So I want to get to that if that's okay. 
So, okay. yeah. So, Chris, there's a question that says, um, when they looked at the one of the graphs you showed, I think it was relatively early on, that the uh, population in uh, U.S. seems to be decreasing, but in Western Canada, it seems to be increasing. Um, and they said, did I interpret that correctly? If so, any explanation? Uh, question mark, climate change, question mark, loss or gain of habitat, question mark. Yeah, let me, um, I'm actually going to go so everyone can see. I'm going to try to go back all the way to that graph. Um, but yeah, that's a really good question. I I think one thing that we definitely know is that it's caused by, uh, largely caused by climate change. Um, so this is kind of the full graph but from this paper, and this was uh, by Crossley et al. 2021. Um, they've done a lot of work analyzing our Western U.S. Um, and across the U.S. the 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 butterfly population trends. Um, and what you can see, like you said, is that we have perhaps some actual increases, um, or at least not as steep of declines up here in some of the northern parts of, of the U.S., um, but really the steepest declines are down here in the southwest, including, again, a large portion of California. Um, and, and what they've shown in this paper here is that this can be explained by recent climate change in these regions. So again, um, here in these two bottom panels, B and C, we have uh, this, the abundance trend, so just how much it's decreasing uh, in percent per year on the y-axis, and we have pre precipitation on the x-axis here. So we can see that um, if we follow our downward trend, the, the populations of butterflies are decreasing with lower precipitation. Um, and so that's to be expected with climate change. It's getting drier in this region. Um, and we also see that the population of butterflies is decreasing with higher temperature, which we also expect with climate change. Um, so again, a lot of this is likely driven or at least exacerbated by climate change. Climate change is one of those things that just kind of adds on another factor to everything else that insects have thrown at them, including habitat loss and uh, insecticides. And so on top of that, when also it's becoming too hot for them um, to survive or too dry for them to survive, it's just another reason why um, populations in those areas more heavily impacted by climate change are going to see higher losses. Okay. Uh, a lot of a uh, lot of issues going on in the world. Okay. So there was a comment somebody wanted to uh, quote you uh, and said, can someone write an article for CNPS with the title, Herbivory is a good thing. It fuels the food web. So um, that's going to be a, a new quote for us. Um, I think that was Brent who asked, um, if there's no support in the literature for moths pollinating citrus, but you were able to identify moths pollinating citrus, um, how, um, uh, how does new knowledge about associations officially enter the knowledge base? Uh, I think I have an idea, but I'll, I'll let you answer that. Yeah, I mean, that's a really good question. And that's that's part of, you know, the issue that we have today is that these sorts of interaction data sets, like the one that I stumbled upon basically to use in this research, um, they're pretty rare. We don't have a lot of widely available and comprehensive interaction data sets that allow us to do these sorts of things and make these sorts of tools for conservation. Um, and when we do, they're really, really valuable. Um, and so one of the ways that we can add those new, that new information is by adding them to uh, interaction databases. And there's a lot of interaction databases online. Um, one of them is called the Global Biotic Interactions, GLOBI for short. Um, and they kind of just compile information on ecological interactions from all over the world. And so we can add that. Um, to those sorts of databases, and that helps researchers like myself do these sorts of studies. 
Um, but another way is maybe to write a paper about it. Um, and I don't know if I'll get around to that, but maybe maybe one day someone will do a, a more formal study on the importance of moths to citrus pollination. I'd like to see that. Yeah, I would say uh, perhaps the answer to that person's question is we need more um, uh, masters and PhD students to, um, to do more research projects and publish papers. Why are you itching? Huh? <laughs> so, uh, all those uh, pollens, anyway, may be itchy. Um, is it feasible to do genetic analysis on pollen taken from moths to identify plants? I think you might have said that, but. Yeah, that, that's actually exactly what I'm doing. Um, in, in another research project, I'm, I'm pulling the pollen off of those moths and uh, using genetic techniques to um, basically discover which plants they're interacting with, which plants they're visiting um, for nectar. Um, so yeah, we're, we're using sort of molecular techniques to do that. And, and that's one of the more powerful ways to do these sorts of studies these days. We can get really, really highly resolved interaction data by using these sorts of tools. Okay, great. I imagine that's uh, sort of time consuming and difficult. Um, uh, you can't just put it in a machine and get out the identification. You, you, you can't uh, like uh, hold your phone up to the pollen and, and find out what plants they've been eating, correct? Yeah, it's it's a bit more involved than that. It's uh, <laughs> it's harder than I would like. It kind of requires learning a whole new set of skills, but but it's fun. Okay, cool. And uh, so Brent says I got Aeschylus uh, buckeye in parentheses for my address, but the only ones I know of are planted, not naturally occurring. Um, I just found it surprising that I got a tree that, to my knowledge, doesn't occur naturally in this area. Yeah, that's actually a really great point. So this this same exact uh, species, Buckeye, was uh, pointed out in a previous talk that I gave um, because it just keeps sneaking in those that data set. Um, and it's probably exactly for the reason that you mentioned because someone planted it in their yard and um, it was recorded as occurring in that area. And so that that's part that's partly an issue with the the species occurrence databases that I'm using. Um, and it's going to require me going in there and getting rid of plants that don't occur naturally in that area. Um, so, so thank you for pointing that out. Um, for, for everyone listening, if you ever discover a plant like Buckeye that doesn't, that you know doesn't belong in your area, please uh, shoot me an email or use the comment form on the website to let me know about that because um, all of you can can help out a lot in this effort of, of improving this data set by pointing out those sorts of errors. Um, so yeah, thank you. So you got lots of compliments, but one of them was from uh, Jeannie Bellaman, who is a uh, leave retired uh, professor of entomolo uh, entomology at um, El Camino College. She uh, said that it was a fantastic talk, and she said perhaps you might give this talk for the Loroquin Society. Um, do you know what the Loroquin Society is? And if not, maybe Jeannie could share with us because I don't never heard of it. He, uh, to, from my understanding, it's an entomological society, I think. Um, maybe I'm wrong about that. But yes, I, I would love to. Um, please uh, reach out. You can email me. And, and yeah, I'd love to. Um, I'm trying to give this talk as far and wide as I can to get to get more people planting the good native plants. Good. Okay, let's see. Oops. Um, all right, Megan says that it's related to her research. Um, so um, you could contact her. Well, I'll ask her to contact you, but she has, if you look her, um, contact Megan at sccnps.org is there. Um, so maybe uh, probably best if Megan reaches out to you. Um, you guys could work that out. Um, uh, I would add that um, Megan, as our, um, well, Megan is doing outstanding work for both the Land Conservancy and for our organization in terms of 
uh, getting a lot of volunteers active in our native plant um, demonstration gardens, which um, and several a number of our um, land conservancy as well as native plant garden volunteers are on on at the meeting. So thank you to all of you. Um, all right, um, let's see. Um, Tara says, all right, it's hard for me to read this. I'm gonna hold on just a second. I'll change the setting here. Um, Tara says, in terms of planting at the nature center that I work at, we have put just a few California natives that are slightly more Southern to accommodate moving species. We've been considering in the upcoming years about selling some of these slightly more Southern plants. Um, and she says in parentheses, Southern more than Long Beach, so that we may help provide habitat as the climate changes. So she wants to know if you have any thoughts, is that a good idea or a bad idea? I, I, do you yeah, that, that's a really good idea um, and not exactly my area of expertise. There, there's been, I know a lot more research into that very idea of, can we have assisted migrations and, and will that help, um, you know, provide more resiliency as the climate changes? Um, and I don't really have a great answer. And um, I would, you know, recommend looking maybe into some, some of the research that's been done. Um, but that's kind of exactly what, I, what I'm hoping to start looking at with this data set is if we were to do that, um, you know, where, first of all, where would we bring these plants? Um, which plants should we be prioritizing if we do that? And those sorts of questions, which I think is really, really important. Um, yeah. but I know I went to the conservation conference four years ago. Uh, that topic came up about uh, whether, um, you know, humans should be involved in, in moving plant species. So if there's a plant species that's uh, become isolated to a particular area, uh, does it make sense to move it and plant it in a new area? And um, obviously there's a lot of controversy about that. Um, you know, over time, uh, some plants would just naturally move. Um, you know, they would thrive in, in a Perhaps a, in this case a more northern area uh, than they, you know, than they would have in the past, and they would gradually move up. But the problem is that there are some uh, plants that are just found in a particular area, and they sort of move up the mountaintop, if you will. And uh, after a while, there's no more mountain <laughs> to support them. And so the question, yeah, is do you plant them, you know, somewhere else? Uh, and Nobody knows the answer, I don't think, because there's always the law of unintended consequences. But does anybody in the, at the meeting still, that's here at the meeting still have any thoughts on that process? Anybody passionately for or passionately against it? No, okay, well, uh, they're gonna talk about it at the conservation conference because it's really um, a critical, critical topic to talk about you know, since humans have a role in plant extinction, uh, what role do we have in plant preservation, uh, species preservation, and what is the role of, of you know, transplanting uh, plants geographically? Anyway, Tony clarified that the Loroquin Society is an entomo entomological society focused on Lepidoptera. So there we have it. Great, thank you. Yeah, I'll I'll definitely look into that more. I should I should be more familiar with them. <laughs> That's all right. Anyway, uh, it's nine o'clock, so I think um, we can stop the recording now. And uh, if you could hang out for a few minutes, maybe uh, people that want to ask 